What made me become an artist was my curiosity. How do you make this? How is that built? What color is that? Asking those questions helped me appreciate the creative process. My artistic journey has been more like a roller coaster than a straight line. I'm very happy to empower, to take over, to say I am here, part of this community. There are all kinds of things that made me want to become an artist, to have license, to pursue interest and odd and weird and big ways this is what i want to do to do things that had big vision art has been able to open doors for me i guess my artist journey has always been to recognize when people gave me opportunity try to seize those to see where the boundaries are to open up possibilities for myself Welcome to Angel City Culture Quest, where art, social justice, and the environment meet in Los Angeles. I am your host, Melina Paris, and I welcome you to this episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Angel City Culture Quest. Today, we are in conversation with two prolific and highly engaged artists who just happen to be married to each other. Carla Diaz and Mario Ibarra Jr., artists in both work and life. Hello, Carla and Mario. It's so great to have you both here today. How are you? Great. Hello, Melina. Hi, Melina. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to be in discussion with you guys today. I'm going to go through some information on our guests. Mario Ibarra Jr. is a Mexican-American conceptual artist born and raised in Los Angeles. His artwork operates as examinations of excluded social norms, often examining complete environments, histories, and narratives. He received an MFA from the University of California, Irvine, and a BFA from Otis College of Art and Design. He has been featured in many local, national, and international exhibitions and fairs. Carla Diaz is a writer, teacher, and multidisciplinary artist who engages in painting, installation, video, and performance. Using narrative to question identity, institutional power, and explore memory, her socially engaged practice generates exciting collaborations and provokes important dialogue among diverse communities. Critical discourse is central to her practice as she explores social, subcultural, and marginalized stories. In her introspection, splashes of color become figures and objects that transformed into scenes of domesticity and city life drawn from her upbringing in Mexico and Los Angeles. Her works have been exhibited nationally and internationally. Carla received an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts in 2003 and a BA from California State University, Los Angeles, in 1999. In 2002, Carla and Mario founded Slanguage after they were both out of grad school. Slanguage, the de facto art school, is an artist-run collective in Los Angeles that hosts art exhibitions, residencies, and programming for youth and adults. Carla and Mario have been at the forefront of many pilot events, exhibitions, and programs in diverse cities, museums, and art galleries around the world. Carla's background in youth education, performance art, and writing influence a multidisciplinary, pedagogical approach to her work, creating dialogue among diverse communities. Mario's conceptual work and interest in alternative histories and narratives interface with art, and cultural contemporary practices. So impressive for both of you. You guys have a lot of work under your belts. And I just want to start with a very basic question for each of you. I'll start with you, Carla. What made you become an artist? Uh, What made me become an artist was my curiosity, my love for finding answers through that curiosity. And I think that curiosity was sort of a vehicle for also observation and thinking about processes that I can use in my artwork. But I also was inspired by my mother who was a seamstress and her wonderful 
kind of creative energy and putting garments together and the vibrancy of that, of what she brought to the table in making those clothes. So both of those things, I think, really helped me to not just appreciate the creative process, but also just work through that stuff of finding answers or asking those questions through my curiosity of like, how do you make this? How is that built? What color is that? And that really thrives my practice and my love and passion for what I make. That's great. And the colors too. All the colors I can imagine you seeing as a child with your mother's seamstress work. Yeah. That really plays into it. Yeah. And Mario, what about you? What made you become an artist? Um, There are all kinds of things that made me want to become an artist, like Carla taking it back to my childhood. I was an only child. I was in a home where my mother worked a lot. For my generation, we were called latchkey kids. We had the house to come home from school and all that. So I spent a lot of time alone and a lot of time being super inquisitive and bored in my home. So like I would come home and I needed things to do. And drawing was one of my favorite things to do besides chasing our parrot named Moses around the house, (laughs) something like that. I really enjoyed drawing. And my father was a drafts person for the naval yards here in Long Beach. And then he moved away to Mississippi. And every month he would send me these kind of drawing, drafting care packages that he would mark on them with tape, like what each lead was used for and all these kinds of things. So every month as a child or every few weeks, I'd get these beautiful little boxes in the mail that were full of all these drawing tools. And that really did lead me to finding like first love in art of drawing. And always also all the kids at school asking me to draw their names, you know, on their backpacks and things like that. that like that's what <laughs> I'm good at. So I guess that led me to be an artist as a young boy. That's cool. You really talked a lot about how much that influenced you with your dad and the care packages that you mentioned that really blossomed for you to become a burgeoning drawer yourself in many ways. Yeah. One day he came to my house when I was in my 30s and he saw my sketchbook and he opened it up and he turned and looked at me. He says, oh, you could finally draw now. Yeah. (laughs) But don't show these drawings to a psychologist or a lawyer, he said. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wisdom, wisdom. <laughs> and next, another very fundamental question. I'm wondering who your biggest influences are. I'll start with you, Carla. So one of my biggest influence, I guess it's a combination of both, you know, some established artists and writers and also mentors in the community for me. I mean, I can think of the top of my head, uh, Norman Rockwell, where I think it's so essential his uh, when we would go to those restaurants, I think it was like those buffet restaurants that they take you to. It was like hometown buffet or something when I was a kid. Yeah. And I would just stare instead of like eating or like getting my food or even having conversation with my family. I would stare at his paintings wherever I could or wherever I would see them. And I think it was so interesting to me because they had a sense of humor, right? But also it was a gathering, a moment that he captured really well in terms of his figurative paintings and drawings. And I just, I was love them. I was like, oh, what am I thinking? And then I would start like making stories about those people that I would see in his paintings. So I just interjected myself so well and connected with him. And then I think it's also Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which was Colombian writer his stories are about magical realism and that kind of world that I kind of felt akin to growing up in Mexico. And I know in a lot of Latino communities and South America, because there's a moments like that, that happen every day in our lives when I was growing up in Mexico that were really surreal, right? That were really magical in a moment where everyday life happened. And then this magical moment, all of a sudden, like it would start raining red all of a sudden. And there was mm-hmm. a, pause for it or like all these birds were all of a sudden like start like flying out and like create this beautiful magical cloud in the air so these kind of moments that I was like wow this really does happen so when I got to read his work I really connected with him and then I think also like my mentors you know growing up in the community and when I came here to the United States and I grew up in Boyle Heights and so 
most of the time, like I had some mentors that I was like, really felt like they were very influential because they not only taught me what was a craft, like in art or writing, but that I really connected with their life story. So I mentioned Manasar Gamboa, who was a writer, poet, playwright, and grew up in the Chavez Ravine area here in Los Angeles. And his neighborhoods were bulldozed. You know, there was like three important neighborhoods there that were before the Dodger Stadium. And I think to me that impact of like, wow, like really telling your stories and being mentored by people like him, you know, really influenced me in connecting Like you could tell your stories, even if they're erased, even if they haven't been told yet, you know? And so I think that connected with me a lot. That's important, what you said about telling your stories. Yeah. Uh, Also, you mentioned Seshu Foster? Yes. There was like different mentors that I mentioned. So Seshu Foster was a poet and playwright also that was my junior high school teacher, an amazing person and teacher but also an amazing poet and I think uh, he gave me that space when I was a teenager in junior high school to really really create and find myself I knew how to speak English but like my English writing and stuff wasn't fully developed so I was still grappling with like my Spanish and like trying to figure out how sentences go and what I was thinking about and so he allowed me to just not judge me, criticize me, like red mark my paper and say, this is not the way you're supposed to do it, just to kind of figure out stuff on my own and gave me like in his room, he had a typewriter. And we I could just go in there and type away, you know, like whatever was coming, whatever I was feeling, whatever sort of impromptu writing I wanted to do. And then we actually had a club, we formulated this club, Poet Beyond Madness, you know, with a couple of other kids like me, nerd Mm. kids who really wanted and had a passion for storytelling and, and writing. And so I really felt like and this he didn't have to do this, you know, this was like after school, beyond probably what he never got paid for, you know what I mean? So I think it was something really influential. And then he would also give me books, his books that he had. And I think to me, that was something really valuable because there was no major bookstores in Boyle Heights at the time. I mean, where was I going to go? There was no Barnes and Nobles or things like that, you know? So to me, that was another person that was really influential in my development as an artist and as a storyteller. That's wonderful. It's like you were the perfect age and you were just like a sponge soaking everything up. And yeah these foundational experiences, I see how they've influenced you and it's wonderful. Mario, who are your influences? Oh, wow. Like, um, like Carla, it was really important for us to have kind of mentorship with the different older generations and teachers within our community. But like my very first early influence, of course, are like my parents and, um, One of the first kind of visual culture things I remember seeing as a child in my house was early neighborhood graffiti on their album collections Mm. and their record collections, like on their 45s and on their record jackets. Because not unlike today, where we run around with our playlist in our phones, back then they had to take all of their records to neighborhood parties And in order to keep their records from getting stolen by other people, they would write their names or their placasos on the 45s, like in broad point markers. So I remember seeing a lot of like Mary Wells album covers with kind of cholo font roll calls on them of like my uncles and my mom and my dad, like big black La Lori Eastside Wilmas (laughs) and stuff like that on the records. That was like one of the first things I remember seeing like visually in my house was like these album covers and this kind of gang writing that was very indicative to kind of Chicano culture at that time. And also, of course, like all the murals that by osmosis teach communities about different things. I've been looking at them lately because I've been taking people on tours and they're usually very aspirational and kind of speculative about like education in the community and labor issues and political issues. And all these things are kind of sitting on buildings on the corners in our neighborhoods. And those things are super influential. And, you know, as a child, you just pass by them and maybe something striking comes out at them. But 
you really don't understand the whole context of them politically or what they mean culturally or significance in the neighborhood. But as you grow older, you start seeing that. And that's really a good kind of influence for me as a child. And then also my older friends were DJs and used to make mixed tapes for the Rhodium Swap Meet and stuff like that. And they introduced me to like the first graffiti artist that I ever came in contact with. And one guy who was originally from San Pedro, a graffiti artist named Flair, he was the first guy I ever saw with a crate of spray paint and his Nissan mini truck. I must have been like 13 years old. And he asked me if I had ever spray painted before. And of course, I said no. And then he said, do you want to spray paint? And of course, I said, yes. <laughs> he added 13 year old boy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he added me a spray can. He was like, well, what's your name? And he had this cool name, Flair, right? And I would just like, I'm little Mario. <laughs> and he was like, well, right, little Mario. So I wrote that on my friend's mother's fence. And of course, the next day, I got all kinds of trouble because I didn't have a cool like hidden nickname i had like my actual name written on the fence <laughs> but yeah those were really important integral early influences for me as an artist that's funny it's like you were already signing your name before you were an artist <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was it was a premonition that's great <laughs> In discussing this, you said that you're often asked from a lot of younger people, how do you choose being a community artist or being a, quote, artist artist with a capital A, end quote? What do you tell them? Yeah, Melina, I often get that question about how do we, is there a, like there is a choice, like there is a kind of questionnaire somewhere that's official that goes out in the world. And you have to check a box whether or not you're going to be like uh, artist at the capital A, like you say, or some kind of community engaged artist. And I always tell them that there's no such thing. There's no such thing as an official form that makes you check an artistic identity like that. And I think Carla and I, you know, when she was talking about her influences, we were very fortunate to have a lot of models and mentors that worked professionally as artists. She was talking about Seshu Foster or other folks. He was continually publishing books at the same time, like, you know, works of poetry and uh, anthologies and at the same time that he was uh, working with young people in middle schools and things like that. Also, our mentor, Manasar, he was also very prolific as a writer. At the same time, he was working in the community organizations that he worked with including Homeland in Long Beach, where we were able to work with him. So there's no such thing. There's no such thing as being a kind of monolithic producer. Like if you want to be an artist, of course you'd be an artist. And there's no stigma or no belittling of that status if you're choosing to engage in communities. You know, sharing is caring. And <laughs> that's the motto. Exactly. That's the bottom line. So now that we have an understanding of each of your past, I'd like to move into what's going on with current projects with you. And I'll start with you, Carla. Can you tell us about your project at Borrego Springs? Yes. So I'm doing this project at Borrego Springs. It's part of the Candlewood Art Festival in March in the springtime. Essentially, different artists come together, are commissioned to do a project. And part of that could be a public project, a permanent sculpture, whatever you know you want to make. And so I'm really excited to be working on this project. And thank you to the curator, Chris Kiramitsu, who actually asked me to be part of this. I am really like working with her. So this project that I'm working on, it's a 5K run that I'm proposing to do at Borrego. And that came about as a kind of uh, love for running that I have. I, in 2017, I had a stroke. And so it really stopped me from doing a lot of physical stuff and running, especially because I have a heart condition. So coming mm -hmm. back to it, it almost feels very revitalizing. I'm very happy to do something that I really love, not just as a sport, because to me, running is really more of a mental processes. You know, it's like I, a lot of it I have to really prepare mentally. And as any runner would tell you, you know, especially when you're doing long runs, you really have to 
make sure of course your body and you're listening to your body and what is responding to you if you're in pain or what's happening but a lot of it is a mental sort of way of going through it you know going through the run and seeing that there is an understanding that I use this analogy a lot like for my life and life strategy and even what I make and how I think about things because there's always a finishing a point right in a race Mm -hmm. and I think sometimes when you're going through a run I mean it's very meditative for me but when you're going through a run you may not see right there's a hill and you may not see the finishing line the finishing point so you have to trust that there is a finishing point that you're going to get there and I think that perseverance that kind of strength that mental strength really has helped me to be able to gauge in my art career my personal life because I am trusting that I'm going to get to the next stage of that, you know, that I, there is a point and I have to trust myself and my mind to go through that. So this project is really exciting because I'm working with the community at Borrego Springs to interview some of the family, some of the people there that have been really key in the relationship there of the history of the place because the way we're doing the run we're mapping specific sites where for instance the farm workers and Cesar Chavez came to the vineyards there and the company there one of the major companies of the DiGiorno family just got up and left because the workers started protesting boycotting with Cesar Chavez so these vineyards when you go and look at them they're like essentially like this cemetery like this visual place of protest and resistance it has such an aura of like these kind of cemetery or this remembrance of a place that something happened there you know especially very politically critically mm-hmm. in terms of the history of the place but nobody has done anything to it like there's just been there you know it like kind of ruins and so to me I want to run through one of those sites to kind of empower to take over to you know say I am here we are present we are part of this community so it's really great uh, I mean in terms of the way that I'm trying to figure out how to work with that and the community has been really responsive so far and again I do have a lot of great help from the curators and the people and the support of the organization there so far. That's great. And you mentioned that the run itself will continue annually. Is that right? Yes, it will continue annually. And also because we are charging a minimum, very small fee for participation. So that money that we acquire is going to go towards the track team in the high school and the local high school of the students is going to go to the school. So we're hoping to raise a good amount of money for that and donate it to the schools there. Oh, that's wonderful. Anything to bump up education is always wonderful, and it'll help the community. It's very exciting. Keep us posted about what's happening with that, please. Yes, thank you, Melina. And Mario, you're working currently with something for Slanguage for a local museum, right? Uh, Yeah, I won't be running, Melina. (laughs) 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 I'll be the catering guy giving water (laughs) to the runners. But um, yeah, I am currently an artist in resident uh, or the first artist in resident at Studio 111, which is in Long Beach. It's been interesting to kind of be there as an artist. And I was trying to figure out how to kind of interface with the architects there and collaborate with them. And an opportunity came up, an invitation from the Long Beach Museum of Art and a young curator there named Paul Loya is organizing this exhibition that will happen in the fall that includes five or six community kind of led organizations throughout the city of Los Angeles. And Slanguage was invited to participate And last year, actually, when we met you, we had our 20th anniversary at the Angels Gate Cultural Center. And that was kind of like an internal look at all the different artists, not all the different artists, but a selection of artists that have worked with us over the past 20 years here in Wilmington at our studio. So this year, I really wanted to kind of incorporate or put together an exhibition with artists that we were able to have a reach with somehow or other across the United States. And I was able to visit the WPA era mural that's inside of the main San Pedro post office. Mm -hmm. We're so lucky here in Los Angeles. I recommend it to anybody to start looking around or find a website that has all these WPA works that you can see because they're really gorgeous kind of 
depression era murals and sculptures and things like that but in the one in san pedro it definitely carries a kind of port thematic with ships and trains and people working and all that but in one corner there's this like funny looking geometric shaped thing polycided thing that i couldn't read what it was and raven that was helping me that day she said oh it says it's an international sundial like this odd shaped thing could take time from like across the planet or across a hemisphere so i was like oh that's really cool i really like that a single object can kind of take a reading or a kind of sampling of time in different places and Mm -hmm. you know throughout the years carla and i have been able to work and engage with a lot of artists from across the country Some of them have come and actually done residencies here with us in Wilmington. Others, through COVID, they were teaching classes from places like Cape Cod, the students here. And I was like, well, why don't we kind of make an exhibition that could kind of mimic the functionality of this international sundial? So when I came home, I found that we had a chips and salsa bowl that was like the same shape. (laughs) And Carla was upset because she said, hey, what happened to my chips bowl? And I was taking it to Studio 111, and I was using it and trying to explain to the architects there that, hey, I want to make this exhibition pavilion in this kind of geometric shape. And um, Jinx uh, Prado and Raven Sanchez, Jinx has worked with us for a few years. They're one of the artists that have worked with us. And uh, Raven is also one of the artists that have worked with us. Jinx, they were one of the curators for our Slanguage show. Right, I remember them. Yes, and uh, Raven was kind of new this year, but they became, like, we became a three-person kind of curatorial team and started engaging all these, like, we chose about 20 artists from across the U.S., from different places along the West Coast and the South and into the Deep South and down into the Southeast, all the way up to the Northeast and some artists in you know the midwest unfortunately we didn't get any artists from any states that ended with sauce there was no arkansas (laughs) kansas or Mm. sauce what was uh, the what was the last one i'm sorry pupusas oh (laughs) (laughs) but um We've hard, we are working with a really great uh, group of artists to be on this kind of exhibition. And that opens in October 5th through January. And it's been really great to be working on a language project at a museum so close to home because we have done several museum projects throughout the years and we've all kind of been in far places. One time we got to work here with MoCA and another time with Slanguage uh, working at LACMA. But nothing this close to the neighborhood here in Wilmington, like right over in Long Beach. So we're really excited to kind of bring these different artists for local folks here in the harbor area and the port area to see. And we've been engaging the architects on helping us design this pavilion and researching materials with them. And it's just been a great way to work with them, even though like the whole projects, I brought in a chip bowl. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they had patience enough to kind of keep going with me on that. I'm really thankful that they let their, what do you call it? Their guard down to, mm. to be open to crazy artists coming in with chips and salsa bowls. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and a different protocol, different way of looking at it. It's very inspiring. It sounds like a perfect combination of everything coming together between you and the curators and the WPA murals and the location and this opportunity with the architectural firm. Everything is perfect. It's coming together beautifully. And it's very exciting to be able to celebrate that locally, like you said. We're we're really looking forward to it. And yeah, it's been a process. Jinx and I and Raven, we've been, you know, learning a lot because we've been going through like charrettes, which are the architect version of a critique and getting a lot of feedback from them. So on our end too, we've had to be open to a new form of discussion and materials and ways of working. Like this is the first time I believe that any of the projects we've worked on has actually had like 3D architectural renderings for them. So I think it's a learning process on both ends between us as artists and the architect. 
Yeah, you said that part of the goal of the residency is to initiate artists and architects working together. It seems like a natural fit. I think we could get a lot of wonderful projects out of something like that. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. It sounds like it's going to be really great. Now, I want to talk about each of your artistic journeys. And I'll start again with you, Kyla. Can you describe in what ways has your artistic journey led or informed you toward the art that you're creating now? Yes. Uh, so my artistic journey has been more like a roller coaster than a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to a lot of friend artists and creative people, and I think that's pretty much some set up for them too, because they're always like, oh, this happened and then that happened. So I think for me, my journey really recently, and I'm just going to talk about recently, as I mentioned earlier, I had a stroke in 2017. Mm -hmm. And that really debilitated me physically, mentally. And I think I had to go on this journey of healing, right? And kind of coming back to whatever I was going to be. I mean, I didn't know if I was going to fully regain my strength. I, if I was going to really be, my memory was going to come back. My speech was going to come back. So I think all these unknowns was part of that journey, right? I think I mentioned to you that I was at first that because of this physical disability and mental kind of challenges, I had to really do puzzles and get back to figuring out what would help me to kind of going through this healing process. And I thought healing was sort of like having this kind of fixture of things because I'm really that kind of person of like, just give me the pill, I'll take it and I'll be fixed and I'll I'll just right away, right? Or <laughs> yeah. so I think to me, it, you know, the doctor said it really well, like he said, no, Carla, it's like a cut. You don't just heal right away, right? It's like you have to let the cut, what, a few days, a day or two, whatever, just start to slowly heal. And then eventually there's some visual stuff of like a scarring that happens, right? So what he kind of that analogy really helped me because I thought, oh, yeah, there's still a scarring even in that healing process, you have gone through stuff, but it's going on your own time in your own process, you don't know how it's going to heal. And so to me, that was really interesting. So I had to really physically be okay. And like I said, one year I was just like doing puzzles. Another year was just doing thread and needlework because I really helped with my dexterity and my hand and my movement and my coordination with that. So in these challenges, I was like, okay, well, I'm strong enough. And it was just points of things. I'm strong enough to do this embroidery. I'm strong enough to do this. So then let me make a series of portraits about my family, you know, with needlework, right? So this was one of my first kind of exhibitions and things that I felt like as an artist I could do because I wasn't sure how it was going to translate Melina mm. as a kind of person that I was like oh my god is this like gonna look good like is it really gonna be like a person or is it just gonna be lines like how is it gonna happen and so that was part of that and I think now that I look at my journey just recently that led me to you know, having physical uh, side effects in my memory and insomnia, right? And uh, this insomnia really, again, just trying to heal myself or finding strategies for myself to kind of cope and figuring out things for myself. I found out that painting and drawing at night through this insomnia really helps me to go to sleep. It doesn't fix it. It doesn't mean like right away, but it just helps it. It soothes it. My mind just kind of relaxes and I can eventually fall asleep sooner. So through that insomnia in these painting process and drawing, I started painting and drawing again, you know. And so it was like, again, connecting and figuring out how is this being rendered? Is it strong enough visually as I remember you know, in my art classes or how my teachers were telling me. But then I just let go of that, Melina. I really let go of that and like figuring out it's just me. This is not for nothing. This is for me. And I didn't let any critic come into that space of insomnia and progress and healing. I still don't. I'm very like protective of that because I allow that space to just play and be and no critics allowed, right? And I think that sort of helped me to push me forward into the artist that I am right now in terms of having that confidence, in terms of having that 
energy to keep making the work that I'm making, which is primarily now focusing on painting and drawing. That's great. I have to say a couple of things. First, the challenges that you had are physical challenges, but I think you unlearning your past education, obviously it opened up a way for you to build your own new education. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's a miracle, but that miracle was work. Right. It was your yes. work. So thank you for sharing how you came through that. Yeah. Thank you, Molina. It's great. Woo, Carla! <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Mario? Can you talk about your artistic journey and how it got you to the art that you're creating today? Yeah, my artistic journey, starting off as a young person, following my father's instructions from the little care packages, then going on to high school. And I remember the first day of my high school art class, my teacher called my name, Mario Ibarra. And then he looked up and he said, didn't I have you in my class 20 years ago? <laughs> and I, I was like, no, that was my dad. And he took a special interest in me and some of the other kids that had a little bit more aptitude for art. And he let us use all of his like real art supplies, quote unquote. And he gave us access to his back room where we could use his real paint and his real pencils. And, you know, where all the other kids were stuck with like newsprint and colored pencils, like we got to use his airbrush and all these kinds of things. So art kind of always, since I was a young person, has been able to open doors for me. And I think that, you know, I've tried to follow through when I see the doors or windows or doggy doors or whatever it is that <laughs> open for me to kind of sneak in. And I think that that has been essential for me and my artist journey, even, uh, you know, as Carla was mentioning before with our mentors and people letting us know people would give me advice as a young man like oh you should go to homeland they have classes there and i would go or oh there's this place in east la it's called south hub graphics you should go and i would always try to figure out how to get there even though like here in los angeles i don't know if outside listeners understand this but it's a huge city back then there were no metro lines or anything like that like you had to ride several buses to get to any destination that was outside of your immediate area. And, you know, for a young man in the 80s and 90s, you had to go through everybody else's hood. Like, mm -hmm. It wasn't an easy uh, task to kind of go do all that stuff. But art always was a kind of path for me to go and for me to pursue things. And um, I'm also going to museums and things like that. I graduated high school when I was 17 years old, so I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I enrolled in a junior college class at El Camino College. It was just like an art appreciation class. This was like in 1992. And they took us to the MOCA to see a really kind of seminal exhibition called Helter Skelter, curated by Paul Schimmel. And there were all of these amazing, crazy artworks by all these crazy artist and i didn't know that that could be art <laughs> i just yeah. thought painting and drawing was art i didn't know that you can make big sculptures using model train sets there was this artist who i'm glad is now getting visibility again his name is victor estrada and he had this huge big goopy monster kind of sculpture that had a little tiny photograph of Martin Luther King on the bottom of it. And it was called, I have a dream or something like that. And I just, I couldn't wrap my head around that. You know, Victor's going to be in this next edition of made in LA, but I saw his work when I was a 17 year old boy. And after I left that exhibition, I was like, this is what I want to do. Like if artists could have license like this to like, pursue their interest in such odd and weird and I guess mostly big ways like there were yeah. like big sculptures and big paintings and big things like these artists for me like they had big vision and I always felt that that was something that I had that I always wanted to do things that had big vision like I told you I spray painted little Mario but I've always thought in my head I was big Mario. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, all of these artists then going on to art school 
I went to Otis College of Art and Design when it was still in MacArthur Park, west of downtown in Westlake. And the students there were also very strange and very vibrant. And I remember all the punk rock kids with different color hairdos. And it was kind of like at the beginning of all this piercing culture. So there weren't really the right types of hardware or jewelry. Oh, yeah. Into the, so yeah. they had like zip ties through their eyebrows, <laughs> and zip ties through their lips. <laughs> and I was like... Yeah, like <laughs> people, you know, and the park smelled like weed and bacon wrapped hot dogs. And we were so close to everything happening in, in relationship to culture in downtown LA at the time. Like the rave scene was going on and the hip hop scene was happening. And downtown was still a kind of just big graffiti mess. There was no Apple store or anything like that. So I think being able to recognize when people gave me opportunity to learn something new that as an artist in my artistic journey, I try to seize those things and work with them and do my best with whatever resources were provided by that place. And I think that's a big lesson for young people is that, you know, I was talking to one of my young mentees the other day and they kept telling me, oh, I didn't know I was allowed to do that. I didn't know I was allowed to do that with my art. I didn't know I was allowed to do that in the gallery. I didn't know I was allowed mm -hmm. to do this. And, and I kind of was getting frustrated with it. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm going to tell you, nobody's ever going to allow us. And as artists, it's our job to be breaking rules. Like, so don't be worried around somebody's going to give you like a hall pass to make a mess in a gallery. <laughs> Whatever. Like, <laughs> your job is to make a mess like you're gonna be an artist that's gonna be your making making a mess and like my grandmother used to always tell me when we were kids she used to tell us you know sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission i'm saying sometimes not all the time but yeah. you know as an artist our job is to like push the boundaries of things so i guess my artist journey has always been to kind of see where the boundaries are and try to touch the fence, so to speak, to see how far I could go with things and open up possibilities for myself. That's great. Yeah, just push further. Like you said earlier, drawing from the toolbox of all these experiences that you've had. That's great. If you're just tuning in today, we are speaking with Carla Diaz and Mario Ibarra Jr., artists in both work and life. Thank you for listening. Hi folks, this is your host, Melina Paris. Angel City Culture Quest is growing. We're barely into our third year now, and there's so much more quest-worthy inspiration to bring you. Art, books, film, coverage of local events, and more. We've gotten a new QR code, so you can capture episodes on the go, because I know you're busy. We've been creating artistic flyers unique to each episode, and new Angel City Culture Quest stickers. And there's more to come. As you know, there are costs to keep this podcast going. So, if you're able, join me in this quest with your support. Think of it as a cultural tip jar to share any amount that you're comfortable with. Even a few dollars a month will contribute to my ability to continue bringing you the great work of these artists, activists, and others, and the cultural content that you want to hear about. I would be honored to have your support. To donate, please go to my Patreon link at patreon.com forward slash Angel City Culture Quest. There you can also see all of our past episodes. Thank you. So I want to talk about common threads or stories in both of your work through time. Can you talk to that, Carla, about some of the common threads we see in your work? Oh, yeah. So I think some of them are about, obviously, like memory, dreams, family. They're about specificity in some ways. By that, I mean, like, it is about me growing up. Some of those things are about growing up in Mexico or growing up in L.A., but it's also a particular time filtered through memory. So it's like the 80s or 70s or what I remember. And then some things are also that I see commonality of things. So humor is one of them. 
I feel that some of that is really, really important in my work. And humor, I like to really bring things or show pictures or draw people that are connecting, but that are bringing some kind of humor to me. I found really kind of like a dark humor in a sense. So like bringing things that are really funny to me. And I'll give you an example just because I can better describe it that way. So the last time that I had a picture of my brother, I took a snapshot on my cell phone and he had a black eye. And I was like, oh, my God, he had a big black eye and he was all bloody. And so you can imagine the visuality of that. But then he was standing behind the background. It was this piñata store in Boyle Heights. And so I was like, oh, my God, I don't know if I should laugh or I should cry because he has a bloody eye. And I want to ask all these questions of how horrible that is that I'm seeing that. But then all the vibrant colors and the piñata and everybody oh, cheering. There were kids in the back. So to me, that kind of paradox, you know, if I can use that poetic language, like that paradox, that contrast, it's my life, it really is dark. And I think that's such a strategy for me. Because I think I have to, when it's so dark, sometimes things that you go through, or like through your challenging, like I just mentioned with my stroke, and all this crazy stuff and things in my family, that I have a strategy, I'm like, you have to laugh about it, you have to figure out, okay, how can I keep going? And so to me, that's always been such a lifesaver where I have to laugh and I have to find the humor of it. And so I think that is really a common thing. But like I said, there's other cultural references and symbolic things that Oprah is having a conversation with my grandfather who is Mm -hmm. holding my house or the roots of my house. Like that is a contrast, right? But it's also funny because Oprah is there interviewing my family. So these things happen in my mind. And I'm like, well, why not? Why can't Oprah appear in my painting? Why can't she just all of a sudden have a conversation with my grandfather? So those are some of the commonalities, if I can generalize. I mean, of course, there's other stuff going on, you know, you could talk about in terms of social context, some of those things are about also paying memorage to like very particular political issues. Like I told you, I rendered my mentor Manasar Gamboa where he was displaced and his neighborhood and Chavez Ravine. So there's some other threads that are kind of connecting in that way. But overall, those are the major themes. Yeah. And the part about Oprah, that was the dream. Is that what that was? Yeah, it was a dream. And like I said, when I have those moments of dreams or things like that, I don't question it. I just render it. I'm just like, it's happening. You know? <laughs> and that's, Put that, it out there, yeah. Exactly. That's where that critic doesn't come through. I'm like, it's happening, right? I don't know why, but it's happening. And the other thing you mentioned when we were looking at your work and your watercolors that you do, you mentioned in the background, you always have that zigzag pattern. It appears in different ways, but the backdrop of it is sort of a zigzag of multicolors. Yes. And you said that's a connection to your heart. Yes. So essentially, that's like the heart monitor and the EKG that they call it when they're like testing your heart. Yeah. It's, it's healthy enough or how it's the rhythm of your heart. And of course, I get those every time when I go to the doctor very commonly. But I just found that that was such a great way for me to connect to that, but also emotionally, right? Like that's a reference for myself. And some of them are very different patterns. So it just depends how my heart is feeling and how I emotionally connected to that in that moment when I make these watercolors. Yeah, they're beautiful. And they are dreamlike and so expressive. I encourage people to check them out all over your Instagram. Mario, what are some of the common threads in your work through time? The common threads in my work through time, like if Carla is thinking about rendering, I'm kind of thinking about surrendering. Like how do we surrender to the normative explanations or histories? And then also trying to bridge the officialities of narrative and historic narrative and the oral officialness or the oral official kind of histories that are passed on through traditional storytelling or just off the cuff storytelling. Like if you spend any time around me, you know, like my whole day is filled with either puns or song lyrics. When people (laughs) say say anything, I'm like, I just get a natural inclination to give a dumb word pun or have some song lyric play out. 
So like those types of ways of, I guess, intersecting or bridging a kind of officialness, which is usually told through like a white colonial position in relationship to histories Mm -hmm. and then trying to dissect that and see what kind of truths or partial truths are in that, but then trying to somehow combine them or splice them with the oral histories or the kind of unofficial histories of a place. Like, for example, you know, I grew up here in Wilmington in the harbor area of Los Angeles, and that's neither here nor there, but there are about 10 different Wilmingtons in the United States. That's but right. There, but there's only one Wilmas. <laughs> yes. Wilmas. <laughs> Wilmas is the kind of like Spanish language nickname for Wilmington or like our Wilmington. And that is like always kind of being swept under the rug as being like a lesser than version of the official white man, founder, entrepreneur, stagecoat, railroad guy narrative. And Wilmas has always been kind of like the brown labor that sustains all of the kind of industry here and also bleeds down literally into the sidewalk. For example, one of my favorite things to show people, it's funny because a a whole thing just came out on Instagram yesterday and people were sending it to me about the history of Wilmington. And I was like, oh, that's all great. But the guy didn't visit. He just Googled Wilmington and shot out some kind of factoids and They're all images from the web that are kind of popular images. But what I like to do when people come to the neighborhood, I like to give them a tour. One of our first stops is at the Banning Park where Phineas Banning had his mansion. And we just had somebody from Louisiana visit us. And when I showed it to them, he was like, that's the plantation house because it's in like a Greek revival plantation style architecture. Mm -hmm. There's a big giant official sign right next to the sidewalk, which reads the Phineas Banning home and gives you dates and all that kind of stuff. And it's very official and looks like they paid a lot of money for it. But if you look down to the concrete, On the sidewalk, there's a big engraving into the concrete of a big Pachuco cross, like the cross with like the kind of flaring lines coming out of it. There's like Mm -hmm. a popular tattoo, big Pachuco cross that says Jesus de Wilmas, L Street, like on the concrete. And I'm like, that's where the embodiment of where the two roads meet. Big official sign of the Phineas Banning house, welcome to Wilmington, and then down on the floor, it's this big Jesus de Wilmas. And so those kinds of things are like a kind of positioning where I feel like I somehow kind of navigate in relationship to my storytelling and to the art that I make. That's a kind of sweet spot for me. I try to use like very specific details from these stories because I try to uh, stay away from generalities, telling these stories from my own agency, because one, who can argue my agency if they tell me that, oh, that's not right. I can tell them to fuck off because it's my agency and like my Mm -hmm. story and like my lived experience and the folks around me's lived experience. So I feel like those themes kind of fluctuate in and out of my work. Sometimes I'll do something out of left field, but that's more or less just to keep them guessing, keep my audience guessing, and then just to stretch uh, what the possibilities are of my practice. Of course, I have failures. I've had many failures in doing that over the years. There are projects that definitely don't get into my slide lecture when... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not the students. <laughs> yeah. it's really edited, edited down to the kids, not the misses. Yeah, that's a powerful image you shared too about banning and the sidewalk. What did he write again? There's like Jesus that we they will miss. Yeah, that's a powerful it's image. Patrick will cross there. <laughs> so, in discussing how you both work together you both highlighted that you grew up together because you were both taking classes at Homeland Cultural Center in Long Beach. Then later, you both really worked together for 20 years and still going with Slanguage, its organization, its projects that you did with the kids. And then still, you both help each other with your independent projects and at residencies that you each have had. 
As you each spoke on this, I really wanted to note how awesome it is to hear each of your expressions that detail the mutual respect that you have for and the support that you give to each other, even through the changes life brings. In your case, Carla, with your mom and taking care of her earlier in your life, but also in growth and in maturity. It's work, as we said before, but you share a commitment to each other and to the work in everything that each of you said. Can you talk about what those binding factors are between the two of you? Carla, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think in that growth, as any growth, you really go through seasons, right? Like just like in plant life, right? You go through planting seeds, there's a growth period, you have to fertilize, right? You have to nourish that plant. And then eventually there is a sprouting that goes on in terms of any plant goes through this. And so there's seasons, there are changes, of course, there are challenges, maybe a bug bites the leaf. And mm -hmm. then you're like, Oh, my God, what did I work so hard for this seed that I planted? And all of a sudden, it just came out of nowhere. And I've been so carefully like planting it and watering it and making sure it has all the nutrients for it to grow. And all of a sudden, it just kills it, the bug kills it. So to me, that analogy really works, because I think it's sort of our relationship and our connecting this kind of connecting factor that you're talking about. It is work, but it's also a love that you really have. Because if I didn't love this plant that I'm planting, and I didn't have that love and passion for garden, whatever drives me, like there is no way I'm going to care if that bug takes it out, right? I'll be like, thank God, good riddance. You know, I was like, <laughs> it's out of my life. I'm not going to think about it anymore. So I think and uh, underlining that is really essential. And I learned that also from my mentor, Manas Argamboa, because that, um, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Hmm. But um, let me get back. Um, that's the word that he wrote. One time I asked him, Manasar, like he was really going through, um, you know, challenging times because he was like, physically you not know, just like as he was getting sick but also like he had a rough I mean he would be in there at homeland and he would be like there was rough kids kids from prison you know like they were just trying to have an outlet trying to just be present but they had all of this stuff right or challenges that I saw and he didn't he didn't face them in that way but I was like oh my god like he just literally I would not care about that kid right I would just like throw him out and so there were all these things that I saw that he really was able to navigate like he just would drive from LA all the way to Long Beach he would pick me up in East LA and then would drive to Long Beach to get to do the workshop on Saturdays. I mean, this was like, he didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. me, I asked him one day, I was like, Manasar, why do you do this? And he said, I'm going to write it down. And he took out his yellow pad and he wrote one word and it said, love. That was it. That was it. And I still keep that. I still have that. Even after he passed away, I framed it because ultimately you have to love yourself, you have to love others, you have to love that person that you're with, and especially your life partner, to really go through all of this. I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm, I don't know what's happening, but maybe I could take a little break. But I think that really defines it. It might sound really cliche or things for people, but I just, I always have to come back to that. You have to love what you do, because there's been times when you question, why do I keep making this work? Why is it so challenging? Because there has been many challenges. Mm -hmm. But I, at the bottom of it is, I love this person. I really love what I do. Yeah. Thank you, Kyla. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mario, can you describe how you both work together? Um, wow, that's a tough one to follow. Yeah, the love, of course is at the center of it a kind of unconditional love uh is really important especially being an artist because for us there's a lot of cliches about being an artist and a starving artist and all these kinds of things and i think through our lifetime now like carla and i have experienced a lot of troubled times as artists 
And we could have made other choices that would have led us down different paths that would have maybe had more financial gains or different things like that. But being an artist was our kind of true calling and the most high put us in places where the creator wanted us to kind of learn from people to have models for being able to acknowledge our creativity, acknowledge our passions, acknowledge our ability to share and give to others who are on the journey of being artists. And they really gave us those values and exemplified those values for us. So to have a partner like Carla, who also shared those core non-negotiable values, has been a real blessing. Also somebody who is fearless. I've seen Carla go through a lot of things and she's a fearless person and she's been able to also share that kind of indomitable spirit with me when I'm doing things and I try to be fearless, simplify a kind of fearlessness and being an artist back with her. We've been together since we were very young people. She was 18 years old and I was 21 when we first started dating. She was living in the kind of core of Boyle Heights with her mother and her stepfather and her siblings in an apartment building. And she said that she liked me because I was one of the first boys to actually drop her off in front of her apartment building and go knock on the door at the apartment building because all the other boys that she was dating before me were afraid to go into her block. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I think that she liked that about me. Yeah. That I was either oblivious and just so in love that I wanted to go into <laughs> her apartment building, or um, you know, I was just fearless enough to kind of pursue her. And on our third date, I remember it so clearly. You know, I picked her up from high school and I was dropping her back off at her house. And she turned around and was getting out of the car. And she turned around and looked at me and she said, are you going to be my boyfriend or what? (laughs) 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 So she was just so uh, fearless, too. And like, yeah. Approach things how she even approached me so I was like oh man this girl's like not like the other girls you know she's a keeper and um seeing her both of us as we've been growing in maturity and through life experiences and challenges of lives and our kind of uh successes in life it, it's been a real kind of adventure and a real treat and I think that's what keeps us around is like we're always surprising each other with what our next adventure is going to be and Carla's been painting over the past couple of years and to see her on this kind of journey of painting and where it's led her and what she's been doing with that and I get a big kick out of it to get to tell you the truth like I'm, I'm happy I'm proud of her and all that but oh man like I just every time I wake up in the morning and I come out and see her drawing table, there's some like crazy drawing there with Snoop Dogg and Menudo and Jenny Rivera and like, I don't know, all these her mom and apartment buildings on fire and like all this some like storytelling and narrative that's going on. So she keeps me kind of uh, I'm like her number one fan for her mini series exactly uh, yeah. kind of a soap opera that she's been making <laughs> and i get a kick out of it being able to like add gas to the flames of it you know i don't know if she wants to speak to that but like i bring her all the like spanish tabloid uh magazines for her to get inspired <laughs> by and I, I bring her paper and pencils to test and you know as i've been seeing her progress from like little small sheets of paper you know now she's painting on what's called a with the on this watercolor paper and the art supply store calls it elephant paper because it's so big and i'm just like oh man i just get a such a kick out of it and i hope that carla shares that sentiment when i'm coming up with ideas that she gets a kick out of those too because we do share a lot of core values and i guess that's really important for us and i guess that goes above and beyond it's just a bigger picture that we're in love with as well we're in love with each other of course but we're also in love together with our community and with our practices and what we get to do and i think that 
keeping ourselves surrounded in that love that Manasad wrote down on that paper is the core of it. Yeah, exactly. It's a true partnership in every single way. And I know, Carla, you talked about how Mario blows you away with his ideas and his big ideas too. So, And I I think that's the partnership. I mean, he's a genius and I keep saying that like to everybody and he just, I I tell him, but I don't know if he believes it or not, but he has so many great ideas, like big dreams and ideas. And I'm just like mesmerized by it. You know how eloquent he's able to communicate that and grasp all these ideas. And in the moment, and I think I gave the example earlier in our conversation where we were like talking about this, that one time we had a kind of mini interview with these curators for a show and Mm -hmm. you know I tag along with Mario and I'm sitting there and it was kind of like they had all these artists scheduled I think it was 10 minutes each artist and they could talk about their work and it was kind of like speed dating and Mario and I were in LA so we're trying to just to get there on time we didn't know what to expect and we're just sitting there and all of a sudden the curator asked well what do you want to do and all of a sudden he kind of starts like coming up with this fantastical, amazing ideas of projects. And then we did this and I'm thinking about that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just looking at him staring like jaw drop because I have never heard of this, but it's amazing. <laughs> it's like, I can visualize. I'm like, okay, right? Wow. And the curators are like, yes, yes, amazing, amazing. And so I'm just like, I'm amazed too, because this is the first time I hear it, because I thought that we knew what we were going to talk about, that we were going to show a CV, that we were artists, blah, blah, blah. No, forget the PowerPoint, whatever. So I think his gift in terms of also, there's a lot of strength of character. And even though he says I'm the stronger person, but I think there's that strength of character that is in that. And it just comes in different ways. And we tackle different things differently as some of the language artists or community members have engaged with us. They engage with us on different levels and we have different strengths and weaknesses, of course. So I think in those, we offset and balance each other, you know, and it really helps to do the work that we do. Yeah. Again, partnership. It's great. And you mentioned, Mario, also that not in a bad way, but it's a hard life to be an artist and you have to have somebody who understands those struggles with you. You said it a little bit differently. You have to have a good co-defendant. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Somebody that doesn't rat you out or... Who knows all the secrets and keeps... They know everything, (laughs) all the secrets, and they still believe in you, you know what I mean? And you still believe in them. I guess in that it is beyond love. It's also about a kind of faith and trust in each other as well. Is like I know that when Carla is doing something or she's going to be engaging in something with me or on her own, I know that I have a deep, deep faith in her and I trust that she'll be able to like do that thing. And I find that that's just in any relationship. And for people listening to us, there needs to be, of course, and sometimes we don't get this is reciprocity in our relationship where it's not just give, 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 or take, take, take. There needs to be a healthy balance of interdependence. Mm-hmm. You know, interdependence isn't a word that we hear too often, but that means that both parties or however many parties are interdependent on each other, using each other's skill sets, using each other's resources. And it's much different than a dependent, which can kind of be negative, And it's not just for taxes. But when you have like a dependent person that you can't do anything without you, it becomes very difficult. Or if you just have an independent person that does everything without you, or then the flip side of that, that also becomes difficult because you feel left out. But an interdependency in a relationship So I would advise everybody, not just, you know, their partners, their romantic partners, their life partners, but in all relationships to set boundaries for themselves where they can find interdependency, where they can find back and forth relationship of give and take from both parties. And there could be an exchange of things. And it took me a long time to get to that point, you know, in my life, but to even understand that as a philosophy, but. I would just part that out as a little piece of wisdom to whoever's listening to this is seek reciprocal relationships, seek reciprocity. It'll help in a lot of regards in relationships. Exactly. And longevity to the relationships as well. Yeah. 
So we talked about your current projects, but quickly, what is immediately coming up for you days and weeks ahead, each of you? Carla, you want to go first? Days and weeks ahead. So I think I mentioned I talked earlier about Borrego. So that's coming up. I'm working on that now, even though it's happening in March, but now it's like the main work, right? Research Mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I'm also working on my solo show with my gallery that's coming up also in the early summer next year. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've been doing this series of works called Corrido, which in Spanish translates to ballad. And these Corrido works, it comes from the term again with ballad or musical kind of terminology. But essentially the work I've been doing is to create my own corridos, my own ballad, my own story visually, right? And how do I tell that visually through drawings, through paintings, through installation? And I'm really having fun with this because I think, again, it gives me that chance of be myself to render images and things that I want to see that may not be your cookie cutter stuff that are traditional, but they're more playing with my imagination, which is the playtime for me. So I'm really full on. And of course, there'll be probably other works that maybe I'm trying to still figure that out. But Again, that's my focus right now of those two things. There's other things in between that are not fully yet confirmed. But for now, I'm just full on focusing on those two things. It's a lot of projects. Yeah. And for you, Mario? Yeah, we have a few things brewing beyond the language studio exhibition. I was talking about the Long Beach Museum of Art. Today, I'm meeting with a puppeteer, a kind of marionette operator and fabricator, because I'm hoping that I could be building a scale version of a parade float that I would like to make called Music My Mother Played While Cleaning the House, which is a parade float that if anybody's out there and has the connection to the Rose Parade, I really would like to make a Rose Parade float. But in the meantime, we're going to make a scaled version of this parade float that will be exhibiting in Albuquerque, New Mexico next year. So for the rest of this year, I'm going to be working on the show that I was talking about, the Long Beach Museum of Art. And then I'll be working on the parade float, Music My Mom Played While Cleaning the House exhibition for Albuquerque. And then also trying to get some drawing done. Carla's been, of course, she's such a force and prolific making all of her drawings. But my drawing practice kind of comes in spurts. I'll do like six months of drawing, a year of drawing, and then I kind of take a break and live life and then come back to drawing. But they've been asked to have a drawing exhibition of 25 years of my drawing. So right now I'm kind of looking for my drawings from when I was a child all the way up to now trying to find those high school drawings I made that I got blue ribbons for in the Mm. the contest. I really enjoy drawing, but I kind of have a chip on my shoulder about drawing too, because I got the worst grade in art school in drawing. I would always get high marks in all my classes in art school, but in drawing, I got a C. It left a real bad taste in my mouth. But I was a little rebel because my father taught me how to draw when I was a child. So by the time I got to art school, I was like, I want to express myself. <laughs> I, gotta, I don't want to do what you're telling me to do. But it is a real meditative process for me. I always think that when I draw, like I feel like my brain clicking and kind of opening up to new things. So yeah, those, those a few museum projects and exhibition that will be in France next year with this drawing thing. Those are kind of my personal issues on top of trying to pass the baton on to some of the next generation's language artists so that they can become empowered to start running programming with this language moniker, like having Jinx curate exhibitions and Raven help with that and education programming. I hope that I could help ease some of the founders syndrome with language and have the next generation of folks take the torch and run with it. So yeah, those are all kinds of things that are on the front burners of my mind. That's a lot of great stuff. I just have a quick question about the drawing. Have you seen significant change in the way your drawings are expressed from college up to nowadays? Yeah, I think I've been able to really upgrade my focus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when I was younger, I, I thought that I could get a whole drawing done all the time in like one session. 
And now I've let that go. And now I've been able to revisit drawings over multiple sessions. And then just philosophically, one of the things I've learned from drawing is that you get all these lessons in school on on the hows, but you don't necessarily get the whys. And as you're going through the process of practicing the hows, whys begin to appear for you. And one of the things that I've had this kind of, I don't know, I guess a philosophical relationship with drawing is that when I make my drawings, it takes more time for me to draw and shade the negative spaces than it does the figural work or whatever is the positive spaces in drawing. And that was just a kind of philosophical kind of light bulb that went in my head because for me, it probably is very similar to life and that you have to really proactively work at getting rid of the negative self-talk, the negative people, the negative environments, things like and attitudes that you were maybe raised to have that you didn't question, but you really proactively have to work on those things. And if you do work on those things, the dark patches in the drawings, let's say, the positive things start to emerge the positive shapes start to emerge. And that has just become, for me, when I draw more of a philosophical stance. So in my maturity, I'm getting to see that kind of stuff where I think in the past, I was just trying to represent something. And now I'm feeling like things are being shown to me. That's cool. And that's progress and change. That's great. We've discussed a lot, but is there anything that either of you would like to add that I did not ask? Carla, I'll start with you. No, I think you pretty much covered a lot of the stuff in terms of our practice and generality of like how we work and how we're approaching things and come together through language. And just want to thank you for having us and having an intimate conversation and taking the time to do this. Melina, I think sometimes it's not a lot of times that we get interviewed like together like this at this stage. And because sometimes people just want to filter some aspects of our practice or individuality of things. And so I think coming and having this connection and sort of broad spectrum, but also intimate, really deep conversations about who we are and what we want, what we do, and what makes us artists, but also how we work together through language is really, really important. So thank you for that. Mm, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Melina. It's always a pleasure to get to speak with you. And yeah, for me personally, like I've been watching and observing Carla make her work, but there were some little details and nuggets that she was talking about today that are kind of insightful for me and give me a broader picture of what she's been working on. Because, you know, even though we are very supportive of each other, sometimes we do silo our work just because that we're working in different studios and Carla's working a lot here from the house and I don't get to hear all of her explanations of things. Yep, so it was great for me. But just in parting, I just like to let our listeners know we both have our websites. What's mm -hmm. yours, Carla? So mine is Carla Dia 76 Instagram and IG. And then my gallery is called Luis de Jesus Los Angeles. So they can also follow that and get more information on that. Oh, my website is Carla Diaz Artist.com. My Instagram is Mario underscore Ibarra with the Y underscore junior. So it's Mario underscore Ibarra underscore junior. That's my Instagram and my website, which we just kind of got up finally after my whole life of not having one is www.MarioIbarraJuniorArtist.com. Also, we have our Slanguage Studio Instagram. We're planning on getting active on that. We've been taking a break since our 20th anniversary show. But since we have these things coming up, we're going to be posting on that. So if people could please follow us, we would love to hear some kind of commentary. Once you hear this podcast, we're pretty open to questions and we're always getting different visitors that would like to visit the studio. So if you have any groups or classes, preferably probably be school groups or classes that would like to visit the studio and see what we're up to. Also, for any young artists that are interested in interning with us or helping volunteer with us, young, I mean young at heart also, but we do tend to stick with college-age students that are apprenticing or interning with us. 
if anybody is interested in that, send us a DM. But yeah, all of y'all that are out there and that are pursuing creative, artistic careers, I just want to encourage you all. It's challenging, but it is also very rewarding. And I also just want to part by saying, facilitate, not play or hate. Wow. Thank you. Thank you both for all that information. And I want to note all of your contact information will also be on the show notes so people can go there and find it as well. With that, I thank you, Carla Diaz and Mario Ibarra Jr. for sharing time with me on Angel City Culture Quest. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, (laughs) Alina. It's been wonderful. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.